Welcome. Welcome to Winning Ways for Your Visualization Plays. It's been a long afternoon. I'm sure you've heard lots of technical talks, seen lots of code, been thinking through some great architectures. Well, this is none of these things. This is about human perception. This is about design. This is about how do we take all that data that we generate and how can we communicate so that when people look at it, they see what's actually there. Let me begin by introducing myself. My name is Mark Grundland. I run a consultancy called Functional Elegance and I help tech companies find fit between technology and markets and it's and at heart I am a designer. I love to make handles for ideas so people can pick them up. So that's that's what I make do for a living and as part of working as a data scientist, one of the things that I've worked quite a bit with is information visualization. And let us begin the story. Well, it begins, I think, about 35,000 years ago. Information visualization is as old as art. And what's, what's remarkable well, is that the reason this visualization was, was created is the same kind of reason why we're creating visualizations today. We would say today, how much? How many hands are there there? Well, I don't know. There's many of them. Well, in most native cultures, there are words for one, two, three, maybe four, five, six, seven, but there are no words for 437. So when you have many, how do you see how many is many? Well, what you would do is that you would take some red ochre paint, paint, um, put it in your mouth and spit. And that lasted for 35,000 years ago. Well, today on our Facebook wall, we, what we do in a sense is not much different. We want to be able to get, get across, not just the numbers, not just the average, but a sense of the data, a sense I am here. Now, I'll just move along, actually. Let, let me bring the story right up to date. So who recognizes this graph? Anybody seen it before? Fantastic. So for those of you that have not seen it, this is the graph that tracks climate temperature change over time. It's called the hockey stick graph, and it is the most controversial chart in science, and arguably, the future of everyone here in this room depends on how people choose to read or misread this graph. Because being able to communicate data so that people make decisions is what so much of data science, at least data science <laughs> aimed at people rather than machines, is about. And you see, people will argue these things endlessly. Two books have been written about this graph. It's a very important graph. So here you have what, what in this day and age is the most important graph in the world. And my question to you is how should we presented. Here is the same graph in three different aspect ratios. Now, if I looked at this graph, I might think that things are sort of oscillating and they've kept on oscillating. And if I look at this graph, I might be alarmed. And if I am Al Gore, I'll be really alarmed. And the question is, basic fundamental question. What should be the aspect ratio? Because you see, we're talking here about information visualization and the decisions we make, make in how we present the information, affect the interpretations of the data that are facilitated or impeded, the story that we are actually telling. Okay, so 
You have in your hands as the, a panel of scientists that let, put yourself in their situation. You have in, in your hands the most important graph in the world. What should be its aspect ratio? Should it be one to one? It's fair and square. Show of hands, who thinks it should be one to one? Ah, oh, a few here. A, 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 a few people like it simple. What about three to two? It's wider than it is, taller, and it is the size of a landscape photo. Who thinks that's about right? Three to two, it seems simple enough. Yeah, there's a few of you, uh, certainly. There might be some, some, some people who like print publishing. Okay, but what about the golden ratio? The preferred ratio of, of art, the most, the, pro, the most pleasing proportion of nature, that magic number that keeps reoccurring in spirals. Who thinks that the golden ratio is the magical ratio? Ah, there's a few of you. Now, what about, what about if we take a more empirical approach and we look at it from the perspective of perceptual psychology, which tells, tells us that if the average slope of all line segments is 45 degrees, well, that is optimal for orientation discrimination. Who, who thinks that's a good way of deciding? Perceptually optimal, a psych psychologist here, very good. Um, well, what about if we take a more principal approach and we minimize arc length while keeping the area under the plot constant? It is short, it is sweet, it is mathematically optimal. Who thinks that the mathematically optimal answer should be the objective correct answer? Anybody? Okay, what about if we, if we just do what seems to be done in our industry, which is take the screen size or the window size and declare success. After all, it fits, so obviously it must be what the user wants. Anybody thinks this is the right approach? Hmm, oh well, I, I wonder, am, am I the only U, UX designer here? Because actually when we do do design, design uh, interfaces for people, that's what tends to happen. What about if we simply say it depends on the situation? Well, what does it depend on? Ah, it is, depends on the story you want the user to believe. Is that the answer? Ah, we have a few politicians here in the room. <laughs> but my point is, oh sorry, my, my point here is more fundamental. And that is that we are all experts in our field, data science, and we cannot agree on something so simple as to what damn aspect ratio a graph should have. When that aspect ratio, you can completely shift the at-a-glance interpretation that most people will take. Okay, but what about what about some what about an, something really quite fundamental, which is how do we select the right projection for a map? <laughs> After all, we are living on a sphere, and the funny thing about spheres is they don't unfold gracefully. <laughs> Whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna distort something. Distances, directions, angles, shapes, area, you're gonna distort it. Well, what you're seeing right here is a picture of the world that the current generation is growing up with, and that is what Google does, which is called the Mercator Projection. And just looking, looking at it, you'd kind of think that if we put together like China and the United States, the great economic world powers, they'd be like bigger than Africa. Well, hell no. Actually, Africa is as big as China, United States, India, most of Europe, and Peru, for good measure, thrown in altogether. Now, why is that a problem? That is a problem because children grow up thinking this is what the world looks like, and it's not it. And 
we take a responsibility when we are creating these visualizations because they shape the user's entire mental framework about how they think about the world. First of all, we can get quite precise about the kind of distortions our depictions have. For example, so one, one really nice, nice method they've developed in cartography is just take the globe, the sphere, put a circle. We call it uh, the Tissot Indicatrix. Uh, call it what we may, but we take the circle and then we see how the uh, two-dimensional projection distorts the circle and, and all of a sudden you see where areas are preserved and where they are not. But of course there's another way of thinking about this problem and that is cartograms. And cartograms are, a, are what modern maps I think in a way should be because cartograms uh, proportion, the size and shape of regions in order to make their their area indicative of a given variable that you're trying to measure. So for example, here is equal area cartograms and it's pretty clear that Africa is damn big. Yet, I believe this is the wrong map for our children to have on their, on their geography classroom walls because land mass in this day and age doesn't really matter. This is what matters. So here we see population, and here we see wealth. This is the real world we live in. And visualization, when designed well, can show the incredible disparity, the surprising connections that Data, though we know what it is objectively, doesn't by itself reveal. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. As we know, data is really easy to summarize by numbers. Mean, variance, correlation, that kind of thing. thing is, you, want, you, want, you want statistics, uh, wherever you stick data, out they come. But information, you see, is best communicated by patterns. Our eyes, our brains evolve to catch monkeys in the jungle. They did not evolve to understand the subtleties between means and variations. And the problem with, with these subtleties is that a few single numbers, well, you miss, you, may, you miss, you miss the forest for simply reducing it to, a, to just a number. So when we think about, about, about this example where each of these plots has the same mean, same variation, same correlation, same regression line, and yet one is a noisy linear relationship, one is a, what looks like a quadratic relationship, one is a very stable linear relationship with an outlier, and the other one is just something else besides that that will probably crash your system if you don't take care of it. And yet, the numbers that we look at on our dashboards, they don't tell us that. Similarly, when we start looking at correlations, which is the, what we use to discover relationships, actually, not only correlation isn't necessarily causation, correlation could be quite quite a good many different patterns. For example, all of these patterns are uncorrelated, yet they are highly meaningful and structured. So what does this mean in practice? In practice, most data has distribution, since uniform, unimodal, bimodal. And most of the time, when we just plot the sum summary statistics, we get this sort of thing. If, if, if the averages just are, the, are, the, are the same, that means that whatever happens is pretty much the same. But of course, data is more complex than that. So then we, want, we bring in confidence intervals. And we go to the next step, which is a box plot. 
Now, they, which is sort of the most commonly used dis, distributional representation of data. And the amazing thing about box plots is that they were a brilliant invention for their time, which was, you know, 1960s or 1950s. Why? Because you could draw them with a ruler on graph paper. Literally, that is why they look the way they do. Now, the problem with this is that you cannot tell a unimodal dis distribution from a bimodal distribution from a uniform distribution. But if we just plot the distribution, out they come just like that. So we have these more modern plots, which I really in, would encourage you, you to at least see if, if you could use, use to better communicate that can capture the nuances of distribution. So what do we have to work with, with when we are trying to express numbers by pictures? Well, the first thing we have to understand is that numbers are a brilliant invention of abstract reasoning. They, re they express absolute judgments. That is something that almost does not in itself exist in nature except, except perhaps in the human mind or the minds of, of whatever other aliens there are in the galaxy, but visual perception. Visual perception, who has a natural kingdom, always makes relative judgments. We only see by comparison. And of course, we can compare many things. We can, we can represent uh, data through position, shape, length, orientation, area and volume, hue, saturation, brightness, texture and transparency, alignment and proximity, containment and connections, labels and glyphs, motion and flicker and sounds and electric shock. I don't know. But there are many, many perceptual qualities we can use, but they all have that, that innate nature that people will, will only make the judgment of discrimination in comparison. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what I mean. OK, um, so basic question. We have, we have some rectangles here. And I like to ask you, which is bigger and by how much? So who thinks this one is biggest? Anybody thinks this one is biggest? Who thinks this one is biggest? Who thinks this one is biggest? Who thinks this one is biggest? Yeah, are they all the same? Oh, come on, come on. That is 20% bigger. You could have seen that. It's obvious. Look, I measured length, length times width. What did your eyes do? <laughs> well, the problem is that what your eyes did is exactly what, what equity traders do when they look at a equity market heat map. Now, I wonder, how on earth are these people supposed to make profitable trades? <laughs> this is their idea of a market at a glance when they cannot possibly appreciate what they're seeing. Yet, of course, that does not stop the world's financial system. So another basic question, which is bigger and by how much? Who thinks that the one here is bigger, on the right? Anybody? The one on the left is bigger. Anybody thinks it's bigger? Oh, there's a few. I believe I made this parallel, but of course, you know, uh, uh, in uh, relativistic physics, parallel lines do strange things, right? OK, which is bigger, by how much? <laughs> which is bigger, by how much? Oh, does that mean that perception is relativistic as well and parallel lines bend? I don't know. But this is remarkable. This is really quite remarkable. This is what your eyes are telling you every day. And this is how you make sense of the UK government spending budget. 
No, and once more, okay, we have, we have these limitations of the way our perception works that are at the most basic level just baked in to what visualization conveys. So here's one, one more example. Okay, which is brighter and by how much? Can look closely. Does this look brighter than that? Does this look brighter than that? Does this look brighter than that? You can, your, your eyes are telling you an incontrovertible truth, which is easily controverted. <laughs> this is, remember, we are using changes of shading as a basic primitive to, con to communicate changes in the data. And we're assuming that when people look at it, they can actually see what we are trying to communicate, which would be nice if it, if, if it were true. So if, if, if it doesn't work with shading, of course, we can try it with shapes. And we're back to the previous problem. <laughs> So what do we actually do as designers? Well, as, de as designers, we accept that people can't read graphs. It's true. It's not just managers. Most of <laughs> us in the room can't do it either. So if, if it's a fact that people can't read bloody graphs, what do we do? We have to label them. Add, Add indications of trends, give context. Make it so that even someone who can't see what's going on can kind of figure it out. So how does that work in practice? Well, I had the following basic problem, and I think one should start with basic problem, problems first, which is getting, getting a bar chart to make sense. Uh, I do many things in life. One of them is online marketing and advertising. And we were looking at a campaign, and we wanted to see the effectiveness this, this as measured by clicks versus impressions. And this graph is usually the sort of thing you would make. But of course, there is something we can do to make it more meaningful. The first thing we can do is we can actually say what those bars mean. Because that way, once you label it, then it is actually obvious. Even managers can read it. And the other thing, because managers, and a lot of us also don't really spend much time looking at numbers because we've seen a lot of them. I've seen a lot of numbers. I don't know about you guys. So when I get tired of looking at numbers, I prefer to just look at colors. And the colors we know are traffic lights. And the idea here is that if you, you spend 0.6% of your impression budget and got 6% got of your click outcome, well, that's a damn good category. Let's color that one green. And it's just like a really simple legend that lets you see at a glance where it is that you need to focus. So, of course, there are many different primitives we can use. I want to mention uh, more closely two of them, which is color and transparency. See, one common error that I see, see quite a bit is that pe people like using these rainbow color maps where you go through, through all the hues. And actually, we know from studies in human perception that uniform color gradients with a difference in the brightness are, are, are much better for representing continuous v with values. And that's the sense that when we're working with color, we have, to, we have to appreciate that the order of color is not obvious. Does red come before green or green before red? And, and that, that might not be intuitively obvious. Also, changes in color create false edges. Yellows come up as as highlights, and, but most fundamentally is, is something that comes back to the way our eye works. So our eyes have much better perception for changes in brightness 
then changes in, in color. So changes in brightness can reveal far more detail, for example. And it is al always taking into account how perception works that helps us, I think, to make better visualizations. Let me give you another example, which is about transparency. So we, in visualization, sometimes we use transparency to represent layers of information. And the, prob and the reason that this technique is actually not more widely used is, is because if you do it naively, I think it's, you know, just, it sometimes doesn't look so nice because in, uh, the transparency is represented using linear interpolation. We average the layers together and Lo and behold, it's an averaging operation, and averaging by its nature reduces variation. So as a result, you get less contrast, you get dull colors, you get loss of detail, and you don't have a sense of selective emphasis. So when I did my PhD at the University of Cambridge, I decided to fix that, which is to design compositing image blending operators that let you take the component images and preserve their key visual characteristics, such as contrast, color, detail, and salience. And it's that idea that when we have a linear interpolation, all of a sudden all the colors and all the, the details sort of fade away. That is why cross-dissolve is called cross-fade. But if we simply apply a little bit, bit, bit of cunning, a, a little bit of a clever algorithm, we can recover that contrast. And if we really play with it, we can take out of each image the part that is most likely to attract the eye and seamlessly blend them together. There, of course, if you don't want to implement complicated algorithms, I, it's always the other alternative is just to hack the damn thing. And this is a this is a brilliant this is a brilliant example where we're looking at how how we can if we render the arc of each, each connection in a, in a Facebook friendship graph in order of decreasing length using a color gradient that emphasizes short link, links, what happens is that the map of the world naturally emerges. So I'm gonna skip really quickly uh, for another example, this is some work I did on news visualization for Grapeshot and IBM, where we looked at using visual metaphors to make, to be able to model the statistical dynamics of news in order to be, to be able in an intuitive way to represent how well a news source is able to attract the, to create influential articles. But I want to move on now just to a few examples. So, so uh, just a couple of examples about representing connections, because this is, this is really quite fun. So often we have these point clouds. And people have been looking at point clouds for a long time. Would anyone want to say, what is the point cloud that people have looked at the most? The stars, the stars, exactly. And what we did is that we turned stars into constellations. Well, this is a technique to do so. So in a very sort of, very sort of simple geometric way that mimics human perception. And it's the, called the sphere of influence graph, where you take a sphere of influence around each point with the radius equal to its nearest neighbor distance and connect every pair of points whose spheres of influence intersect. Sect. It works in any dimensions, in, in various distance metrics, and has this nice property of reconstructing the patterns that the human eye would draw. This is another really interesting example of how we can use 
use visualization to better understand structured data. I think all of us, all, all of us, of us here at some point have seen so much JSON or XML, it brought tears to our eyes. And I, and, and I find one of the things that, that text editors really suck at is giving any sense of overall structure. Well, actually, it's so damn easy. Just color each node according to its data type, type and plot the structure of the expression tree. And all of a sudden, you, then if, you would have a, if you would make yourself a sequence of these plots, you would see which data record is the odd one out and how so. This is another really interesting approach for understanding, for understanding texts. Um, and, and, and the idea yeah, here is that we take a text and we write it out along the radius of a circle. And then we take, and then we take each term and place, and place it according to its average position in the text. So the terms that are the topic of the whole text are in the center, while the ones that only occur in certain, in certain sections of, of the text, like the introduction or the conclusion, they will be off to the side. And then you can start looking at the relations and the connections between them. Really, really beautiful alternative way to navigate the structure of a text. Um, I'm just going to give one more, more very, very nice example of how do we deal with connections. And of course, ultimately, connections are about graphs. And we know how to draw graphs. We've got good algorith algorithms, simulated annealing, spring systems, and so on. Graph drawing is an entire field of research. But the problem we, we eventually wind up with is that if you've got enough nodes, and if you've got enough connections, what you're going to have is something a cat would cough up, a hairball. And, and it doesn't really matter what graph drawing wing algorithm you use. use you, need the, you need, in, a, in some sense, to simplify the picture. And this is a really nice example called hierarchical edge bundles where you group connections belonging to related nodes, and all the nodes are placed along the circle. And the idea here is that actually when the person is looking at the graph, they can't really see the, make sense of the whole thing if it's densely connected. But what they're looking for are relations between individual nodes, nodes and that is something that using this type of visualization we can very well represent. So just summing up, what is the secret to great information visualization design? Well, this is of course only my humble opinion, but it is how I like, like, how I like to work and I, and I invite you to consider it. First, do not start with the graphic. What is it gonna look like? Second, do not start with the data. What does it have to represent? No, start with the user. Who are they and why do they need it in the first place? There are some basic, basic questions to ask here. What will this allow you to do that you can't do now? What difference can you observe in your business? What value do you expect that this will add to your business? What will, will this let your customers do that they can do now? How does this fit with your overall all, all strategy? What is driving these requirements? How, how will you know that a visualization has been a success? How do you build on this success? And then you really take a take a step back having heard everything and ask the one true question, which is, so what? Now, given that I think I need to finish, yeah, I do, such is life, I'd like 
to invite you to ponder the future of information visualization. So we are living in an information economy and the remarkable thing is that there is no shortage of information. We have more of it than we can possibly know what to do with it. That's why we're all storing it on servers, hoping that it has a future use. So in an information economy, there is no shortage of information, but only genuine understanding and true insight are in short supply. So. How will information visualization evolve in the future? Will, will interaction play an ever greater role? There is, there is a lot of research showing that when people actually look at something, it kind of is like a blur across their eyes, but when they get to play with the data, poke the data, tickle the data, explore the data, make a discovery of their own in the data, that is when they form a relationship, where they relate with it and really, really create, create the memory, the impression that stays with them. So then there's, here's another question. We, we know how to do a lot with animation, but we seem to be only using it for transitions. Will animation design become ever more central to information visualization design? Well, for example, we use animation to in some way express uncertainty. And then, then there is a, are all the questions about how visualization fits with emerging technology like augmented reality. Will, will, we, will the next generation actually have a visualization layer superimposed on their everyday life every time they look out of their glasses? What will happen when we have an ambient, a cheap ambient display that can turn every wall into a, a potential visualization. How will that, how will that change design? Design, how will, how will we even know what to visualize? And, and of course, as virtual reality and gesture interfaces evolve, I would imagine that they would touch on visualization as well. But I have spoken enough, and I would like to end with putting the question to you, my audience. What do you think the future of visualization will be? Thank you so much. Thanks again, Mark. Uh, do we have uh, questions from the audience? What about the hockey stick visualization? What ratio should it be? <laughs> you know, I am an, an optimist, and, I've, and given that it's been already published, I, I believe it should be exactly the ratio that it is. <laughs> Otherwise, we're all in trouble. <laughs> you are welcome also to ask about some of the challenges you've had with information visualization in your own work. I'm always happy to hear and see if together we can help. Well, I may have a question, maybe. Um, so. There, I mean, there seems to be a lot of uh, custom work that you do to create uh, some of your visualization. Uh, but if you would, I mean, especially if you're producing a lot of plots, is this like a choice of library that, uh, that you say, I like to use this because it allows me to convey the right message with a minimum amount of work? So I think that's, I think that's a really, really good, it's a really good, good question because our libraries are a little bit like the blinders we put on our eyes in the sense that the entire sort of visual design culture of modern business has been def defined by Excel and I having actually once worked at, at Microsoft, seen Excel compile 
I've always thought that, that there were issues here that we should think through more deeply. So my preferred workflow for designing visualization is to design the visualization itself in Illustrator. Sometimes I will work with, a, with just, just a simpler tool like Keynote or PowerPoint. Uh, but Illustrator is really good. And then, then for the actual automated reporting system, I find that Mathematica is an excellent tool because anything that you can graphically describe in, uh, illust in Illustrator, just about anything, you can probably reproduce parametrically in Mathematica in a way that you can uh, program it, pro in a programmatic fashion, define the structure of the graphic display data. Having said this, I am sure there are some excellent Python tools. tools. It's simply I have not, not had as much of experience with them as perhaps some, some of you. Thank you.